Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's uh, National Arts Club at Home program. Uh, my name is Nicholas Lowry. I am the chairman of the Fine Arts Committee at the National Arts Club. I also sit on the club's board. Uh, it's my delight to be with you tonight moderating this exciting conversation. Oregon is in the house. Thank you, Oregon. We did get Oregon waiting for Alaska. Uh, for those of you from around the country who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based here in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Uh, annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public. This past year, they've all been uh, virtual. These include exhibitions, theatrical, musical performances, lectures, and readings. Uh, for more information about the club, the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, tonight's presentation will be appearing on the club's YouTube channel at some point in the very near future. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, uh, Everyday Magic. Um, we will have a lively discussion today. We're joined by the organizers of the event, Jenny Mushkin Goldman and Rebecca Goyette. Following the discussion, there will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the, the Q&A function for any questions you might have. Um, and with those initial statements out of the way, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the screen uh, Jenny Mushkin Goldman and Rebecca Goyette, uh, the organizers of this fantastic exhibition here at the club. Uh, and they will introduce us to the rest of the cast tonight. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Nico, and thank you to the National Arts Club um, for hosting this event and um, this wonderful, uh, the wonderful experience of, of putting on everyday magic um, that my co-organizer and I worked on for um, over two and a half years, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Um, so before we introduce our um, artists, I just want, well, I wanted to give you an idea. Well, actually first, um, we should say that there is the, we're going to hear from uh, Kinza Najim uh, from Pakistan in a, in a pre-recorded video because it is, what is it, like four o'clock in the morning, her time? Exactly. So, um, and then, uh, but we're going to then speak with Jay Sheree. Uh, Abachandani and Jesse Bransford, um, incredible artists that are um, in the show as well. And um, yeah, I'm very excited uh, to talk to everybody and hear everybody's questions afterwards. Um, but we have a brief slideshow that we'd love to uh, share with everybody to give you a sense of what everyday magic, artistic and Gnostic impulses as um, like some installation pictures because we're unable to see it in person now. Um, so Everyday Magic, Artistic and Gnostic Impulses, it's a group exhibition that considers how artists and spiritual practitioners use ritual as a catalyst for social change, personal transformation and alchemy, both metaphysically and corporeally. The exhibition explores the inherent power generated with artistic creation and how ritual allows the artist to claim or reclaim sovereignty. Many of the artists presented identify as spiritualists, whereas others have an awareness of magic and spiritual practices related to their work. For some ritual is self-invented, made necessary by personal experience. Everyday magic encounters a global pandemic and a multitude of crises that have exacerbated social and economic inequities. Through forging artistic bonds, sharing expression and ritual, we move from isolation to community, seeking safer ways to come together. This exhibition provides an opportunity for the viewer to engage with various interactive rituals on, on one's own, creating an individual cathartic experience within a communal dialogue. And um, these are, Yes, we have see J Jay Shree's work right there, Moon Goddess, uh, Kinza's work in the back, uh, mm -hmm. Jesse Bransford, all the artists are, are seen in this uh, installation, the two installation shots. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so it's our pleasure to have Jay Shree and Jesse here tonight. Jay Shree Abhichandani is an amazing sculptor 
Also, she is a curator and curated an amazing trilogy of exhibitions at the Ford Foundation recently. And she also is a, a feminist activist. And I met her when she invited me to be a part of her Me Too protest in front of the Met Brewer Museum. Um, it's really a thrill to have been able to work with Jay Shri on this exhibition and, and include her work. Um, uh, it's really an honor. Um, it's also an honor to be able to work with Jesse Bransford, who, uh, who I've gotten to know through his work at NYU. He is a professor uh, who leads the art department at NYU, but he also leads a, a yearly occult conference that is um, that people travel from all over the globe to participate in and to learn more about occult practices. Jesse has a pronounced occult practice that's a part of his artwork as well, and you will hear more about that from him. And um, and I would like to introduce uh, the video that we made tonight, um, which is uh, oh, actually earlier today, where I interviewed Kinza Najam, who is an amazing artist uh, from Pakistan who's been living in New York and is now living in Miami uh, during the pan pandemic. And she's a feminist artist and she's also, um, she's also has a PhD in psychology, which really uh, is important to her work as well. So uh, we can hear from her through the video. Hello, we are here with Kinza Najam an amazing artist from Everyday Magic, Artistic Gnostic Impulses at the National Arts Club. Kinza is here today, chiming in from Pakistan, and I have a few questions for her. So today uh, I wanted to ask you, Kinza, your piece for the show, the installation, Pleasure and Veil. How did you conceive of this piece? Thank you, Rebecca. First of all, I'm honored to have my work um, in this much awaited uh, exhibition to you and Jenny for curating it and for National Arts Club um, for providing the space. This piece is uh, a piece that I conceived um, three and a half years ago. And I uh, am an interdisciplinary artist and I work with, uh, my main medium is paintings and I work with found objects and that are everyday use objects. So this piece, um, I was visiting my mother three and a half years ago. I come every year, like I am right now in Pakistan. And uh, um, most of my family members don't cover the, uh, with the hijab. Hijab is a head, head scarves um, mm -hmm. for, for Muslim, Muslim uh, women and uh, I had a couple of cousins who started wearing them and we were in discussion and they saw me as the New Yorker who is on the bell curve, you know, all the way extreme here. And I was like, why do you cover? And they would tell me that they are covering them because they, when they teach and the, in the men's school, they are um, sexualized by these males and they don't want to be sexualized and they want to be taken seriously. They want the um, students to pay um, attention to what they're saying. So it was an interesting piece of information for me to find these two cousins who are very close to me and they were wearing clothes like me. We grew up together in a very secular you know, household in a family that doesn't cover. And, um, and, and they kind of that, the, those, that dialogue pushed me to see the, the head scarves more deeply and uh, to, to, to figure out there are more uh, definitions. So I started collecting these um, by inspired by them, uh, by women who were wearing them by choice in Pakistan and in New York and in Miami. Mm. And I started collecting them and collecting their uh, narratives of uh, when, when people see them in the West, they feel on, they have sometimes just one more unique uh, definition that these women are repressed and they're wearing it by force. And I wanted to bring more narratives to more complicated nuanced narratives. So I started collecting and these women who were wearing them were like, we want to wear them. We don't want to be oppressed by the West when we wear them. And we are asked not, not to be 
wearing it and they were really frustrated. So I wanted to bring their stories in. And, and hijab is a visible headscarf, you know, for a Muslim identity. So I'm interested in bodies and identities and, and, and themes that are similar to that. And then in Pakistan, when I came, I was uh, going to, um, going out with my mother and this woman was selling these naras. And I had, I was asking my mother, how come, uh, you know, these are not worn anymore. And she told me that because I don't wear it, you know, like you can, so I'm wearing this, so this is uh, what I'm wearing. And, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. So this is what I'm wearing. And then this is the shirt and the Nara is usually worn and you tie it, you mm -hmm. tie it. And it's like a, a belt, which kind of, um, is a, a belt that covers the private parts of men, women. And every time the, the, the word is called N A R A Nara. Mm -hmm. The ones in the installation, you saw the naras and the hijabs were in an installation. The naras, which are always hidden and invisible when uh, it's worn, um, I made the naras more visible in the installation and hijabs were more inside. And as Rebecca, as you were the one who installed that uh, piece, I was super excited about that. So that work, I was <coughs> telling my mother, how, you know, like, uh, how come this thing has become obsolete? Because only underprivileged women and men and minorities <clears throat> and people who are work in household, they wear it. The, so there was a class thing that entered that very everyday use object, you know. So I was like, this everyday object has so much, it's so layered and it has so many connotations attached because it's private and the private, I wanted to make it visible. So every time I would look, a man would sit and if his Nara is showing, nobody was saying anything. Wow. But if a woman is sitting and her Nara is showing, oh my God, that's like her private parts are showing, you know, symbolically, the, at least in, in Muslim culture, because it's almost like an invite. Like if I show my Nara, I'm inviting you to come and, you know, like, do the jiggy jiggy with me, the, that kind of, uh, you know, connotation. So it really blew my mind because I never, uh, I never heard it. So this was my first time hearing it like that from my mother. Uh -huh. And that was mainly the inspiration behind that piece. And then I interviewed the men, I brought the stories and um, that have been hidden and uh, were not brought to the surface with the hijabs and the naras. So that's, that was the main inspiration. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that you think of the whole process of, of exposing these naras and showing the hijabs as a magical process. Like there's a process of transformation that's happening in this work. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I thought that um, these, these naras and these hijabs that are everyday use objects, when I asked these women to tell me their stories, and, and, and Rebecca, you know, my background is in psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, so with psychology, I'm really interested in the moment when the, the transformation happens in your psyche. And we all have those uh, times when we are always struggling or we don't know, we are stuck in our narratives, right? So I found sometimes that by asking a simple question from people, uh, from these women and some men also, and some Jewish ladies in New York as well, who mm -hmm. were wearing the wigs to cover their their head as headscarves, just by asking simple questions of bringing the narratives that have been, been hidden, that has been not given a voice, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I thought it, it, it was, it, it just by asking that question and for women to bring their stories of, um, oppressed stories to the surface. I thought it was really interesting when I asked them that I'm going to photograph you and the, in the installation, going back to the installation, when people can go and see there are women that have been photographed bottom down, 
Mm -hmm. Their face is not visible. So I asked them um, and they were like, you know, you, we, we would be very proud uh, because we want our stories of shame, of abuse, of rape, of pleasure, of dishonoring their families. Some of them had lovers and, and these stories that were completely like shoved under the carpet when the interviews happened and they were, I asked them to show the Nara. So they were standing, they just picked the shirt up, which is a very shameful act and as a sub subversion as an as a way to uh, as a way to protest they were showing the nara sharing their stories and saying please use our names please use our faces even because we want these other people uh, who will interact with this work because they knew i was working on a project we want them like we are releasing the shame through telling these stories we want them to release their shame by telling by feeling um, liberated enough to release their shame. So I think this, this idea of shame is a very universal idea, Rebecca, that we all, no matter where we are in Pakistan or first world country, third world, they might, the themes might be different, but we all have uh, been traumatized by shame growing up. Definitely. And you, know, you shared a, a very simple ritual to perform with people in the gallery. And I was able to lead that ritual at times where um, people stand in front of the piece, they close their eyes, they breathe. And then they, when they open their eyes, they pick a Nara that, that they find attractive and they touch it. And what, by touching that Nara, it's also a way to re relate to this idea of releasing shame. So, um, so people were very much connecting to this physical act of solidarity with with um, women who shared their Naras as well. Uh, I was curious about some of the personal stories, uh, not to be too personal divulging, but like some of the stories that you have about um, your interactions with, with um, women who shared their hijabs and Naras with you. Yeah, I, uh, a little bit of the story I shared about my cousins who wore it by choice uh, mm -hmm. about their narratives for the hijabs or the headscarves about the Naras, um, I, uh, was sharing, the, uh, the, I was, um, when I was doing the project, it was very difficult for my mother to understand why I left being a doctor, a PhD doctor to move to, uh, being a full-time practicing visual artist or interdisciplinary artist. And she almost, uh, never understood it, you know, up till that project. And uh, in that project, uh, she was telling me how, when I asked her to show her Nara, she shared with me how um, in, when she was growing up, you know, she had a certain, um, how do you say, incidences where the Nara was opened without the will or where it was not a full blown case of rape, but there was, you know, some kind of molestation, which I think brought us together as mother and daughter. And I think she also understood that um, why I'm doing what I'm doing, why I shifted, because I wanted to create a dialogue. I wanted to bring these taboo topics up front, you know, for us to talk about. And I think it was, for me, it was very emotional, um, kind of moment where we, the mother and daughter connected and she shared her repressed stories of shame and I shared mine. Both had no language or the platform to talk about uh, because there was so much shame attached with mm. these uh, taboo things. And, 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 and with that, uh, there was this kind of barrier because I was blaming her and I, I don't know, I, we, we, we just didn't understand each other. Mm -hmm. And I think through that project, there was more empathy towards each other to bring these narratives forward. Um, so, so I was able to share some of the similar uh, incidences with me where I wasn't wearing the Nara, but similar, uh, symbolically similar things which happened to me as a kid. And I was able to share and she was able to hear me out and we bonded and we connected and um and i think it uh, it it just humanized and i i could see her more as a human being than you know me blaming her for certain things which i did growing up 
Um, so I think it was a moment for us to, to be able to uh, transcend that, if that makes any sense. Yeah. No, it's so amazing because like the story that you told about your cousins wearing the hijab because of their own personal preference. And then in contrast, um, some of the the releasing of shame when showing the Nara and, and getting past that taboo. So it, it is that you really are complicating our gaze upon this idea of feminism from a from a Pakistani Muslim perspective, you know, um, which is so important for us to understand that that you know, we all face similar things, like you mentioned, um, different like sexual abuse and um, and even just molestation or, or even touching the Nara is like touching one's body. It's a violation, you know, right. so we can all relate to that in our own way, but it's very specific um, to your culture as well. Uh, so that I love yeah, that about I, the piece. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. I also wanted to bring rituals into this because I think the ritual of touching those naras when I was asking people to touch them and to close their eyes because for me there is this huge overlap between the sacred and the profane mm -hmm. where both of them need space to grow you know right. the sacred needs space and, and the profane needs space and the profane or the sexuality is one of the most creative energy of human beings, which we repress in our societies, right? Mm. Uh, it's black and white. There's no fluidity in between, you know, for the masses. And, and, I, and I feel that this uh, installation was an invitation for people to release their shame and to allow themselves the pleasure to create rituals that give them the pleasure in their lives, you know? Yeah. Um, the tactility, the sound, the, the colors, all of it really brought people in and engaged them. We're, we're going to have to move on with, with um, our talk tonight, but, but we, uh, I think you said that maybe we, be, we could meet your mom before we go. Here. So here she is. Huh. Oh, it's so wonderful to meet you. Rebecca. This is uh, my mother and this is Rebecca. Yeah. Hello, Rebecca. Oh, um, you you, are... your daughter is amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And I can't speak English. Little bit I know. <laughs> We, we really appreciate what you brought to the work as well. It's amazing that you got to share that moment with your daughter too. She was very brave and I think I got my courage from her. Uh, but the, the sound piece, if I show here, I don't think I will be allowed to enter, enter the, the, yes, we should, we should, we should shush here. We will, I, I kept it discreet. Thank and you. We will we will leave it at that. Pleasure and veil with Kinza Najam. Thank you so so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoy your family trip Thank as you. well. Thank you for having me. Okay. That was, that was a great interview. Rebecca, thank you. Kizna, thank you. And your mom, thank you. Um, we're going to move on now and talk with one of our artists who's here with us tonight. Uh, Nadine, if it's possible, can we put up some of Jesse's artwork in the background now? Just, I, I think it'll help people who haven't seen the exhibition yet to, uh, to really get a feel for it. For those of you who haven't seen the exhibition, uh, and who aren't as far away as Oregon or London, just want to remind you all the exhibition is open through April 27th. So there's still six more days to come and see this, this exhibition, which is really one of the most uh, unique and engaging installations that the Arts Club has had. Uh, also, it's in the National Arts Club brand new gallery too. So it's, it's a beautiful exhibition in a beautiful space. We'd encourage you to come in. Great. So now we have Jesse's uh, work on the screen. Jesse Bransford, welcome. Um, you know, I, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't realize you were a, a uh, an occult conference organizer, an amateur occultist. This is fantastic. I have a feeling that your work is laden with ritual. Uh, and maybe just as a, as a primer, with this piece up on the screen, can you tell me um, how, how ritual manifests itself in this piece and how it manifested itself in your creative process? Uh, sure. Um, 
first of all, thank you, everybody. Um, this has been a real pleasure, and um, it's great to sort of get to talk about some of these ideas, particularly, you know, in an institutional framework. Um, I came to art uh, as, you know, a um, as a way of finding uh, meaning, essentially. Um, I went to school studying art and also studying the history of the sciences. And um, history of the sciences sounds so far away from magic that it's kind of begs the question, but the, um, the genetic origin of um, science as we understand it today, cause and effect, um, all of that sort of boils out of um, our more con uh, collapsed ideas of, of how things happen. Um, and magic was used as a term to describe it um, right when we invented language. Um, so for me, magic sort of came in as a connective tissue between my interests in the, the history of the sciences and um, the history of, of fine art or art making or object making. Um, the, the magic here um, is really a, a subset of a kind of magical practice that's known as talismanic magic. Um, I know that Rebecca did a workshop. Um, you did you did a workshop, right, Rebecca? Yeah. Yeah, on talismans and and sigils. Yeah. So the idea here is that um, there's a there's a a transference of energy through intention, right? We um, when we make a picture, um, if if anybody's taken a drawing class, like you. Um, you're trying to draw something that's outside of you. You're trying to make, make an external uh, representation of something that's ex external to you already. Um, magic sort of is a little bit less, it's, it's, more, um, uh, it's more basic, right? It's more primal. And it's the notion that um, the energy and the intention that um, making a mark on a piece of paper or, or making a mark on a, a material um, if done with certain consciousness of, of uh, your environment, um, you can have a, uh, an effect, um, be it, uh, I mean, the classic one, I think most, most teenagers of my age, like, you know, did the love spell thing, you know, you have the, the crush on the, the person that's unattainable and you cast a, a weird little love spell and then are embarrassed about it for the rest of your life. Um, I don't know I what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Never did that. I sort of took that embarrassment and, and basically ran with it. Um, and then found um, through my art education that actually fine art, um, um, that the history of fine art, fine art um, really is, is littered with um, artists and uh, practitioners. Um, there's a lot of magic. Um, the easiest example to bring to the table would be um, the Helma of Klint retrospective at the Guggenheim, um, God, almost three, I think that's like three or four years ago now. Um, but that was the single, uh, most attended exhibition in the Guggenheim's history. So um, the the difference or the notion that this is a um, a sideline or a a not a, a trivial aspect of artistic practice, I think, is um, is a bit of a misnomer, or at least it is in in uh, my understanding of art. So so Jesse, let me ask you: looking looking at this piece now, uh, for the uninitiated, how how can we appreciate this? Tell us what to see. Um. Again, I, I think the easiest way for me to start was, is with the artistic appreciation. Um, it's a series of lines that are um, hopefully, I mean, I'll give you my intent and you can agree or disagree with me in the chats, but the, um, the intent is really structured around the notion of making a pleasing form, a pleasing image that has a kind of seduction attached to it, that has a kind of, of um, unarguability about it. Um, I think circles in particular are um, extremely resolved forms from a pictorial standpoint, um, but then to extend lines off of that circle in a couple of different ways, um, it sort of augments or, or elevates um, the containment that the circle creates. Um, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, I don't know, let the cat out of the bag or something, but um, this image is actually a quotation. So this is another um, thing that I'm working with pretty intensely, which is um, there are there is a, a large history, um, particularly from the, the advent of the printed page to now, um, of people collecting um, these sigils and images that they thought worked. Right? Mm -hmm. um, if it works, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Right? So there is a um, a history, both licit and illicit, um, pretty much in every culture I've I've looked into. Um, of these little sort of um, uh, 
uh, spell books, right? And the spell books have like um, instructions and or images that um, the, the spellcaster or the um, practitioner uh, copies or refers to. Now, it's not a simple quotation in this instance because I've done things like the, um, the original image, which um, you just imagine a really quickly drawn, very old, crusty looking ink drawing that's just black and white. Um, that was what I was working from. And so what I brought to it, hopefully, um, is my intention through my training and through my visual interest um, by sort of refining it, sharpening it, um, putting it in a context of, uh, of really elaborating the symmetry, but also drawing attention to the places where the symmetry breaks down, which um, the, uh, the curly cue at the bottom of the circle for me is really important because I think um, if we are thinking about literally trying to win a discussion or to win somebody over, I think that this notion of like a clear and articulate um, argument isn't always enough. You have, there always has to be a little something extra. Um, another thing to say too is um, in all of my work that uses direct magical uh, quotation from historical sources, um, almost in every aspect or in every instance, the color is, um, is my sort of like contribution to it, that the, the images would have not had full color um, as a reference point. Does that help? Yeah, that's fantastic. I think we have one more piece of yours in the slideshow too. I'm wondering if we can switch to that. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, again, I mean, this, if you talk about runes or, or cryptic writing, this one, this one seems a little bit more uh, linguistically oriented perhaps than the first one. That's a, really good, uh, that's a really good way of imagining it. I think um, one way that these vocabularies evolve in wh whatever sort of um, place of origin they come from is a sort of, um, not confused, but a, a complicated relationship between written language and the fact that we can look at a mark on the page and translate it into some, and that and there, there's an ambiguous space. Like when I look at um, Sanskrit, for example, I might be able to recognize one or two of the syllables and make a, a sound related to it as someone that doesn't read Sanskrit natively. Um, but I can still feel uh, uh, there's still a relationship to it, both formal and, and otherwise. Um, I should point out that uh, both of the drawings that we've had up on the board here are coming specifically from um, the Nordic magical traditions. Um, and I, I, I'm not so interested in um, cultural specificity, which might get me in a little bit of trouble, but I do think that, I think that magic, one of magic's real powers is its ability to have, or is its proven historical um, reality of um, clandestinely or publicly uh, engaging uh, different cultural uh, perspectives and, and exacerbating or elaborating on places of commonality and places of overlap, but also places where um, uh, innovation can happen. And this is where, again, science and magic for me have a really close, tight relationship that I think we really take, ad take advantage, or take for granted rather um, in a lot of ways. And I, I have a, a just a sort of a practical outside of the ritualistic and magic realm, a practical question for you. Um, and, and a very, very lowbrow, I apologize. And, and from my question, you will realize that I'm, I'm asking it from inside the art world. Who collects your work? It's interesting. Um, you know, there's a whole other conversation. I mean, there's so many conversations that can use the magical as a, as a context. Um, and I think, but one of the things that's really of interest for me right now is um, this notion of value. Um, I think the art world in particular is, is having like a, it's, it's, seized, it's seized in a very interesting way because of circumstance, be it, um, you know, obviously the COVID pandemic has, you know, ground things to a halt. But I think before that, there was starting to be, there has been and continues to be somewhat of a confusion of where the power of an art object actually exists. And I think one of the simplest ways, um, particularly in American culture, to, to, um, val to put, to map a value that everyone understands is through the dollar sign. And I'm saying this in a way that hopefully draws attention to the fact that like the spuriousness of value in this context is, is real. Um, and I would argue that, that the dollar value that we place on art objects has like a kind of magic or has a kind of like um, uh, 
yeah, a kind of magic attached to it. Um, who, but to answer the question directly, um, something that's changed as my work has become more explicitly about magic, a more traditional collector um, that would buy work from a brick and mortar gallery in, in Chelsea or Soho, um, they have become less interested for the time being. I mean, this, this is all subject to change. Um, and I've been collected more consistently um, by um, fellow artists and also um, younger collectors that are always, um, that are basically gravitating towards my smaller works because um, from a dollar value point, um, they're easier to, to pay for. <laughs> so there's the lofty answer to the question and the basic answer to the question. I hope that did it. Great, great answers. And you know, the, the, the value of art is likely about to go through a seismic shift as art, more and more art becomes a non-fungible token. Uh, Talk NFT. about magic. That, like, I mean, that's not, that's not magic, that's black magic, that's voodoo. But and actually, yeah, actually uh, the, um, the, the whole morality, the way, that's a whole other context as well, but um, many anthropologists that I'm fond of, um, there was one I was talking to today, uh, Michael Taussig, if you don't know his work, I highly recommend it. But he, he's quoted as saying is that, that global capitalism has, has pivoted on the blackest magic of all, colon, money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Listen, that's great. Jesse, thank you so very much. Your, your work is inspiring uh, and uh, it's also very aesthetically pleasing. I'm not even sure if that's what you're going for, but I think you, you, take it. you can't deny that. We're delighted to have you in the show, delighted to have you with us tonight. I'd like to turn now uh, to uh, Jai Shiri, uh, Abhi Chandani, uh, Jashiri, are you with us there? Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? I do hear you. Uh, welcome. And, um, you know, it's very interesting as a juxtaposition, um, not a judgment, but a juxtaposition. Uh, Jesse's work in the show are, are very small pieces, and yours are very big and very prominent pieces. Uh, they, they, really, they really catch the eye. And... Um, I, I, there's just there's so many questions that I have for you. Uh, let's start out here with the, with the Blue Moon Goddess. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit about the the creative process and, and your inspiration that went into this piece? Uh, sure. Yeah, this piece is kind of a composite portrait. Um, in 2019, it was the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots. And I've been part of the queer South Asian community for a really long time. And I went to this party that my friends have been hosting for 22 years. Um, and I kind of reconnected with a whole host of my um, queer family. But then what I noticed were the younger folks and the ways in which they were expressing their sexuality in this gender non-binary way, which was quite different from the older drag queens that I had been in community with. And I really love this kind of assertive and playful occupation of multiple identities. And I wanted to kind of turn that into the divinity that I thought it embodied. Um, so this piece, um, the pose that the body is in is a classical Indian dance pose from Bharat Natyam and I got some friend, a friend to basically take pictures of herself in the in that pose and send it to me so I could sculpt it. And then the moon has kind of multiple references. Um, it's very important in Islam and it's Ramadan. And so there is the moon kind of thingy. And, you know, with Islam, a lot of figurative art is not allowed. And I spend a lot of my time mucking about with Hinduism and Buddhism. I was born into Hinduism and I've abdicated it since. But I do like to play with the iconography of various religions. And the moon is something that is um, you know, up for grabs, I feel, because um, it may have a particular symbolism with Islam, but it's something that is a part of mythologies across the world. And within, say, Bollywood dance, because this piece very much refers to Bollywood songs and music, the moon in Bollywood songs is very ambiguously gendered. Sometimes the moon is male, sometimes the moon is female. So kind of bringing, bringing in 
that mythological queerness of the moon into this piece and using it to kind of extend the figure's penis into this kind of, you know, uh, magical space. Um, and the, the base that is built on is kind of a three-tiered cube, which is meant to indicate its ascension up to the heavens. So you kind of ascend to the heavens and here's this, you know, fabulous uh, celestial body with the moon that's celebrating their um, sexuality and their existence. And um, those are some of the things that I was thinking about with this particular piece. I don't know if you have um, a slide of the other work that I, that's in the show, which is, yeah, this is a self-portrait and it's um, very recent. I think I made it like two months ago. Um, so with this work, basically I'm just recovering from some skin cancer and during um, my recovery time, the cracks in my family became very apparent. And uh, I come from a very patriarchal, misogynist culture and family. And, um, you know, like if, if you can focus in on the, on the image all the way on the left, you will see that the figure has three heads and the, the bottom head has a vulva as a third eye. And then it has two other heads and in one hand, she's holding a joint, which you can see, but what you can't see is that in the other hand, she's holding the head of an old woman, which is the, basically my mother. Um, and I don't know how to explain this, except to tell you the story of how very unlovable my parents find me. And the reason that that figure has a vulva on its head is because that is what my mother suggested. Um, when I was 22, she suggested that her that my father and her pay for plastic surgery to have my pubes implanted onto my eyebrows so that my vitiligo would no longer be an issue. Um, so this self-portrait is very much like an embodiment of the feminist adage, the personal is political, because I may be taking a very personal story and put turning my third eye into a vulva, but I think that you know, most women I know have been told this lie that something is wrong with them and been made to feel really inadequate in a patriarchal society. Um, and that really is what I'm looking at in this work. I mean, the things that are said to us are things that we internalize. So when those, when the people who say those things may not say those things anymore, that voice is still repeating in your head. And so the reason that my mother's head is in my hands is because I am in the process of trying to get rid of her voice from my head at the moment. It's, and, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful, powerful visual statement and a powerful personal statement. And it, it sort of makes me wonder, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't feel this is too personal a question. I hope it's not too personal a question. Too personal a question. When did you decide to become an artist? At what, at what stage in your life? Um, oh, wow, that's such a difficult, I think that when I was a little girl growing up in India, um, I lived in a town called Busavel, and two young women came to visit us, and they had just come from the Elora and Ajanta caves, which are like second century BC uh, Buddhist caves, and they un unfolded their work in front of us, and they had these watercolors of this monolithic temple in India, the Kailash Ananta temple, which has been carved out of this mountain. And I fell in love at that moment with, with art, with the, that watercolor, with that temple, with those girls, with everything that the possibilities of art that it represented, because I was no longer this powerless little girl in Busavel. I was completely transported and I knew that, you know, this is what I wanted my life to be. And um, it's taken a very long time to, to make that happen. Um, it's taken, you know, many decades of working in other jobs and working on my own um, skills. I, I guess the, the follow-up question is, with, with that origin story in mind, when did you actually reach the goal, in your personal opinion, that you had become an artist? 
Um, maybe, you know, maybe like when I got my MFA. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a very good goalpost yes <laughs> yeah i mean because the thing is as someone who you know i mean my mother didn't my family didn't allow me to major in art as a undergrad um so i minored in it and i paid for most of my own undergrad anyway because i went to queen's college um but when i started to make art in the 90s you know nobody understood what the fuck i make now right it was like a very different time and Queens College had an abstract expressionist program. Um, and so it took a really long time for me to come to a place where I felt comfortable even calling myself an artist because I started off as a photographer. And, um, you know, there's always that kind of uh, bifurcation between photography and art and, and representation. And I was raped by a photographer and that was enough to put me off photography for a very long time, perhaps forever. Can you can you speak to the third photo there, the the scar on the on the figure's leg? Yeah, so that's what I was going through in December and January. I had my surgery on December twenty second, and um, they took out like six inches from my leg, and and. A lymph node and it was some of the worst pain that I have experienced in my life and so it went into the work you know the kind of experience of just leaking lymphatic fluids for weeks and weeks and the intensity of it all like you know um yeah it seems by by looking at the chat that a lot of our attendees tonight uh, all agree about the, the the intensity and the power of these pieces Thank you. Um, do you find these works to be helpfully cathartic to you? Yeah, very much so. I mean, um, I think the days that I'm not able to make art, I feel like I'm losing my mind. <laughs> you know, um, I just, I can't live without it. I've tried to do other things to make a living because being an artist is not financially viable and um, now I have, I'm married and have a partner who is a white man. And so he can, you know, financially support the equation so I can pursue my, um, art in a way that I just didn't have the privilege to do without being married to a white man who makes that money that white men make, you know, as a Indian South Asian woman of color. We both graduated from the same college the same year with the same marks and I still make about 40 to 50% every year that he does, you know. So that is the reality. On a practical level, how long does it take you to make a sculpture like this? It doesn't take long. I'm like, I am fiddle away like nonstop. I'm fiddling as we speak, you know, <laughs> so this, this piece probably took me a day, you know. Wow. And, yeah. and the blue moon goddess, the, the original image we saw? Uh, the moon goddess, it, I mean, that probably took me like two weeks. And, and I will ask you the same crass question that I asked Jesse. Where, where is the market for your work? Who, who is the market for these? <laughs> uh, there's barely a market for my work. I mean, there have been galleries who have represented me, particularly Rossi and Rossi in London that sold some work. Um, but, you know, I'm in a bit of a vacuum. I have my community that supports me and I just sold a few paintings to, um, to a local South Asian collector which is great. Um, but yeah, I mean, my community pretty much supports my work, you know. Listen, I, I, I thank you for sharing the inspiration with us and sharing sharing the the backstory on all of these. I, I want to thank Jesse also. Having, having you both here tonight has been such a special occasion. Uh, we're very honored. I'd, I'd like to open up the floor now, the, the virtual floor, as it were, to questions. I know a lot of our attendees have been really engaged. I've seen a lot of interesting comments and questions along the way. Um, I think several people have lambasted me for asking why, why, I'm, why I'm curious about the market for your work. I, I take that lambast, that's fine. Um, art can be approached from many different angles and we approach some of the ritual and some of the magic, I guess, 
like a like a Led Zeppelin, I approach it from the practical point of view. Um, but for, for those of you who are attending now, if you have questions for the artists or for the organizers, this would be a great time to put it into the chat or the Q&A function. Yeah, I really love a comment by Wendy who says, um, Wendy Moscow says, such a powerful and subversive repurposing of traditional imagery. I really thank you for that comment because that is exactly what my work is doing, is taking that language that is very traditional and rigid and like messing with it and saying all kinds of things with it that really need to be said. And actually Tony asked a question, which I think is gonna be perfect Rebecca for either you or for Jenny, which uh, he, he says, I'm especially interested in the ritual component of magical art and in the notion of ritual interaction being part of the gallery going experience. And I know that this show has had with it several ritualistic days or events. So I'm wondering if you could just briefly speak to that. We don't have a whole lot of time left, but it's such a great. Uh, um, sure, I'd, I'd, love, I'd to. love to. I would love to. So yes, we hosted a number of rituals and um, the first one was Courtney Alexander's uh, piece offerings to God herself. And Courtney came to the gallery um, dressed in a performative uh, ritualistic costume that's actually hung on the wall of the gallery now. And each one of us was to bring her an offering. And so she, by becoming a deity as a black woman, she was trying to say that she was not there to perform for us, she wanted us to give to her. And by giving to her, we would get something back tenfold. That was a beautiful ritual. And then um, and then there was also Kay Turner and Elizabeth uh, and Sonia who did a wonderful ritual that, um, that had to do with healing Persephone's wounds. And each one of us was given a red ribbon that we were um, to consider like a wound that we could get rid of. And each one of us was given a word that that ritual would be connected to. I got mother, some people got president or rapist. And so we had to consider what that wound could be and how we could dispel it. Um, and then of course, with Kinza's work, we could touch those naras and, and people could come in and perform their own personal ritual whenever yeah. they wanted. I'd, I'd like to. I understand that there was so much interest in ritual. There was practically a riot around Gramercy Park on the yes. spring solstice. Is that? I mean, yeah. that clearly shows that the world is more more than just Tony asking the question. That everybody is interested in the ritual aspect. What what happened? That, on that was for the spring equinox. Um, but I'd I'd love to touch upon um, like when uh, Rebecca was mentioning Keynes's work. Um, there's several works in the ex exhibition that allow for personal interactions so that the viewer can have a very intimate experience. Um, like um, Alexis Carl has um, Altar for Life Continual in that um, work. And we'll, we could, I could send images to anybody who wants to know um, uh, later. She actually created tinctures where you could smell it. There's so she had these personalized, um, personalized scents. So it not only is a visual experience, but also a, a multi-sensory experience as well. Yeah. And um, going back with Pinza's um, Naras, I I brought my mother to see the exhibition, and she's from Mexico, um, different culture but also felt like she was from an oppressed, um, you know, she is from an oppressed patriarchal society. And when she went to touch it and I explained the, the uh, installation to her, she was immediately um, really moved in a, in a very uh, visceral kind of way as someone who doesn't un know the art world. Um, so yeah, that, the intimate experiences also are very powerful. Listen, we're, we're, we're just about out of time. So I just want to take a moment to thank everybody again for joining us, to thank uh, Rebecca and Jenny for organizing the show. Uh, Jay Cherie, Jesse, thank you for sharing your insights with us. Again, there's six days left to see this extraordinary exhibition. Join the magic, join the ritual. You, you have a great inside track now on, on some of the key pieces in the exhibition. So please come down to the National Arts Club. Um, and with that, I bid you all a, a, a fond good evening. Uh, have a wonderful night. Thank you all for participating.
and we look forward to seeing you uh, here again on the National Arts Club uh, at Home Arts Channel. Thank you, everybody, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.